Uh, I'm not going to read all of, uh, of, of Paul's uh, resume here because he'll be telling us, I'm sure, lots of stories. I just want to read the last part of something he sent to me in March before he made a presentation down in Thomas Auditorium. Some of you might have been there. But if you weren't, you wouldn't have heard this. Paul is grateful to UMF for, for providing him with his start as a scientist. That's nice. Even more importantly, he recently celebrated his 31st wedding anniversary to a girl he met at a Purinton dorm social in 1978. <laughs> Pretty neat. I bet you will see her on your slide presentation. So, Paul, you tell us all about you. So we won't have to knock at the lights here and you're ready to go. Okay. All right. Thank you all for um, for coming. I'm I'm nervous, and the reason I'm nervous is that I gave a talk, as Dr. Riesler said, about a month and a half ago, about protecting Sebago Lake. I don't know if any of you were there, but that's what I do now. I'm the environmental manager for the Portland Water District. So preparing for that talk wasn't really all that hard because I've been doing that for the last 14 years, and so I think about Sebago Lake pretty much every day. Um, on the other hand, this talk, on mixing an ophiolytic melange in Greenhorn, Oregon, is about my master's thesis, which I completed in 1985, and I have not really done bedrock geology since 1985. I mean, occasionally my job dabbles in a little geology, but not like this. So this was the most intense bedrock geology project of my whole life, but I finished it 28 years ago. How many of you were born 28 years ago? <laughs> So, so I will just tell you that I, I had to prepare, I think I estimated 40 to 50 hours to, to do this one hour talk because I, I actually went on e eBay and bought some of my old textbooks back. I kind of, I'm not making this, I kind of wanted to do this anyways, I was really sort of eager to do it, but I, I wanted some of these old textbooks that I was familiar with and I've read three books and about a dozen journal articles to prepare for today. I'm not the most qualified geologist in the room by far, so if I say something and you think, that's not really the way we think anymore, I really apologize. This is what I thought 28 uh, years ago. So this is an overview of how my talk is organized. Um, first, I'm going to, I can't help but, you know, the road from here to there is I was an undergraduate at University of Maine at Farmington starting in 1978, and I wound up in the mountains of eastern Oregon. Uh, for you know five or six years later so I'm gonna tell you the story of how I did that I you know maybe not because it's the only way if you're interested in going to grad school and doing a master's thesis or a dissertation but I'll explain to you how I got there um, I, I a lot of my preparation for this is like I had to go back and kind of reread some of the the founding foundational uh, texts and and documents related to my thesis area and I couldn't help but see how still to this day, you know, plate tectonic theory when I was a, a student here, I don't know, it was maybe 15 years that it had been really been accepted by geologists as kind of the key unifying theory of all things geological. Now it's been 35 years or so more, so it's, and I'm amazed at how it's still, you know, a lot of times a theory is in vogue for a while and then you learn more things and it kind of gets dropped, you know, you drop that theory and say, well, now it's revised in this way. And I'm certain that there have been revisions to kind of the details of it, but it's amazing to me how plate tectonic theory is still holding together. And it, and it kind of, you, you, the grand unifying theory of everything geological, it's kind of like everything makes more sense. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. And then the, the core part of my talk is about rocks in Greenhorn, Oregon a melange of rocks, which I'll explain what that is, and my thesis was to sort of, they're all mixed up, melange means mixture, and my thesis was to unmix them. How did they get so chaotically confused the way they are? And so that's kind of the core of the talk. And then, you know, I can't help but talk about what lessons I learned in the process of doing this. Okay, so my first three stories. I, I have some stories in here, and here are three of them. The first one is called Farmington 1978. I think I like it here. The second story, this is a quote from Dr. Riesler, and I'll tell you about that quote. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about Field Camp, which I went to in 1981. Okay, so if you wanted to step outside, we could go about 200 yards from here, and I, I can show you the exact spot that I was standing when I saw my wife for the first time. All right, I'm 18 years old, I'm a freshman, I'm living in Purington Hall, and I'm walking to get my dinner, and I'm in the crosswalk, and okay, I'm an 18-year-old freshman on a college campus, so part of what I'm doing is what girls are, you know, are here. I've been here three weeks, and 
I see like the prettiest girl I've ever seen walking in the crosswalk. And I can remember it so distinctly because I had two thoughts. Thought one was, wow, she's pretty. And thought two was, she's out of your league. I'm not kidding. That's exactly what I thought is, you know, it's nice that she's here, but she's not any, you know, anybody that you could ever date. Um, two weeks or so later, I was at a dorm social, first floor Purington Hall, sitting on the couch, listening to music, and all of a sudden, boom, she sits down next to me and says, hi, my name's Pat Red. what's your name? Like, how does that ever happen? And we, we basically have been together since that moment. We started dating and we got married a few weeks after we graduated and we're still together. So anyway, after I met her, you know, my plan was to transfer to Orono. I was gonna only be here for a semester, maybe a year, and then transfer to Orono because I was a forestry major and you can't get a forestry degree here. But after I met her, I just felt like I kind of like it here. <laughs> so I stayed here for all four years. And another, another important person, not, I'm sorry, not quite as important as Pat in my life, <laughs> But another important person is in this picture here. This is from the 1980 New England Intercollegiate Geological Conference in Presque Isle. And that's Dr. Eastler. And Did I forget to take my shirt? I can't remember. He, um, he was my advisor my first year. And I took environmental geoscience. It was the first class I took on this campus. And a Christmas time or so, I met with him and he said, so what's your plan, you know, as an advisor does? And I said, well, I am a forestry major and I wanted to go to Orono, but I think I like it here. And he said, well, why are you a forestry major? And I said, and I, this is true, I had a career goal. I want a green pickup truck and a walkie-talkie. <laughs> That's really it. It wasn't really trees. It was just I wanted to be outdoors. And he said, geologists get pickup trucks and they get paid better. So I said, okay, I'm a geology major. That's how it all happened. So he also said, and I would say the same thing to any of you that wants to be a geologist, which I assume many of you do, if not all, he said, you got to go to field camp. Now, you don't need to get a, uh, go to field camp to get a degree in geology. At the time, there wasn't even a major in geology at UMF. There was a, I had to create an interdisciplinary major, so I was a geology chemistry major. By the way, I hated chemistry, and he said, you really need the chemistry if you want to be a geologist, so I became a double major in geology chemistry. This is how influential he was, for better or for worse. Um, so I was a geology chemistry major, and he said, you need to go to field camp, because if you want to, you got to go to grad school, because you need a master's degree. If you're going to be a geologist, you don't, you don't want to go out there with a bachelor's degree, because you'll be logging core your whole life. You want to get a master's degree. And I didn't even, I don't even know if I knew what a master's degree was at the time, but he said, you got to go to field camp, because they'll look for that. So anyway, if I'm going to go to field camp, which I, I decided to do, I said, I want to go someplace cool. And I grew up in Massachusetts. When I came to Farmington, I'd never even been in Maine before. And so I wanted to go someplace far away. I'd never really been out of New England, so I went to Alaska. So three years later, after that conversation, I found myself putting my gear on this bus at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, 15-hour flight. I mean, this was like a cross creation for me. I remember just being <laughs> stunned when I got there. I can't believe I'm this far from home. And a week later, this bus was in the Talkeetna Mountains setting up camp. It was just an amazing experience, both for just seeing Alaska for six weeks and camping out in it was amazing. The scenery was amazing. The geology was really, I'll tell you what is important about field camp. I mean, I, I was a decent student. I wasn't like the greatest student of all time, but I got good grades. But I could read books, I could, you know, but books are like an interpretation. Somebody's already looked at the rocks, interpreted them for you, and then written it in a book. And I was pretty good at that, reading it and then answering multiple choice questions. But you go to field camp, and for the first time, there's no book. It's a rock. Like, there's no words. And you have to figure it out. And that was hard for me. And, but I'm glad I did it, because a few years after this, there I was in eastern Oregon by myself, and all there were were rocks. And so really doing this was just a great experience. It was, it was fun, and I learned so much. And so this is us getting up one morning. This is the Denali Highway, which I always called the Denali Dirt Road, because it's this many hundreds of mile long dirt road. We got up in the morning. We took our bus out for the sunrise, looking at Mount McKinley. This is from like 100 miles away. That's how big that mountain is. And again, a kid from eastern Massachusetts seeing stuff like this, it was just an amazing experience. Uh, we did some great geology. This is the Usabelli coal mine in middle uh, central Alaska and a nice layer cake geology. We measured section in there. And it was a great field camp because they started us in simple rocks like this and then as each, each place we went, we went to four places and they got more complex as we went. 
So I learned a lot. I got to take pictures. I mean, again, eastern Massachusetts. Blue Hill is the highest mountain I'd really seen, and then there I was. So I would really recommend you go to field camp. I learned so much there and had a great time. Came back here. This is the unfortunate mustache years. I apologize for that. But anyway, we, this is my wife and I and her best friend on graduation day, which was in May of 82. And then June of 82 is when we got married. And we went to Oregon. Why did we go to Oregon? Well, I wanted to go out west to do geology for this reason. This is Maine. This is some typical bedrock geology exposures in Maine. I don't see a lot of bedrock there. It's mostly trees and, you know, the Appalachians are an amazing geological setting, but they're so old, they've been weathered down, covered with soil, and trees have grown on it. And it's really, I mean, geology is complicated enough without covering 99% of it, and all you get is these little pieces to look at. You go to Oregon, and it looks a little more like this, where it's all rock. And so it was, you know, the mountains are bigger, the rivers run colder, and you can see the geology. And if you're going to try to do geology, it's nice if you can at least see. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle, but you only get two of the pieces in Maine. In, in Oregon, at least you get all the pieces. And I got to go to places like this. This is Newberry Caldera in Oregon. And so you can see the back wall of the caldera here. And you see this beautiful cinder cone right here. There's a lake that's filled, you know, where the caldera has collapsed. And then look at this, an obsidian flow that you can just see. Like, you can't mistake. You're on an obsidian flow. And just imagine how slow glass must have been erupting out of the side of this caldera and flowing down there. So it was, you know, the geology in Oregon is, is amazing and it's so much more understandable to me. I remember even coming back to Maine, you know, just frustrated that where's all the rock? You know, all I can see is trees. Okay, so now the next part of my talk and preparing for this, I really kind of went back and reread a lot of stuff that I'd read 30 years ago and some new stuff. And I got to tell you that I think my biggest revelation is that I don't think I was amazed enough about plate tectonic theory back then. And even geology in general, I was sort of mundane about it. Like, oh, that happened 200 million years ago. Or that happened 250 million years ago. Wait a second, 200 million years? How was I not stunned? And, how, and, and plate tectonic theory is just, to me, it's amazing how it all sort of explains so much. And by that I mean, if you read early geology, 1800s, 1900s, and into the early 20, you know, the 20th century, the problem is they had no way to, like they did a lot of observing. They described rocks, and the descriptions are amazing, how much descriptive geology was. But there was no explanation of why. Why are these mountains here? You'd get a description of what rocks were in the mountains and how deformed they were, but it really made no sense, like why are these rocks deformed? And I find that incredibly frustrating to read old geology. I think, how did, because, all right, I'm going to tell you something about me. I don't, as far as the science process, the part I don't like is collecting data. You know, like the detail work. Some of you probably do, because I, I hire scientists now, and some of them love the, going in the lab and measuring stuff and analyzing samples. I hate doing that stuff. I want to get to the big picture. What does it all mean? Why? I, I don't like the what. I like the why. Well. Plate tectonic theory is the why. You still need people to go out and, and look at those rocks very closely and get all kinds of observations, but then plate tectonics tells you why they're there. And it kind of reconciles all these descriptions. And that's what I'm still impressed with as I read about it. Another thought I have is that we're talking about oceans opening and closing. Okay, go to Old Orchard Beach sometime and stand there and look across and imagine that closing and completely disappearing, so there's no ocean left. Like, oh my gosh, how are we not stunned that we, ah, the, the, the ocean, the proto-Atlantic opened and closed. What, that's not a big deal? And that, that's what I find now, is I'm just amazed. And the process is very dynamic. Think of how much force it would take to force an ocean open and then close it, but it's so slow. I mean, you think since I've been born, you know, the plates might have moved this much, and yet, an ocean has opened and closed. You know, it, it, I don't know why I wasn't amazed before, but I am now. The thing is, it's very slow. Like plates move, I've read, like at the rate your fingernails grow. But there's plenty of time, you know. So imagine opening the Atlantic Ocean at the rate your fingernails grow. And how was I not amazed? That, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't amazed enough, and I am now. So anyway, it's also, and this is the kind of the key to my talk, is plate tectonics, 
when you hear it described, it seems, and I'll show you some cartoons that you've probably all seen before about plate tectonics, it makes it seem so smooth and neat, like, oh, you know, ocean, is, ocean crust is formed at the mid-ocean ridge and it's destroyed in a subduction zone. Well, that's not, there's a lot of force involved and there's a lot of disruption that occurs to the rocks and that's what my thesis is about. Plate tectonics is not neat. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of force being exerted and the plate boundaries are where you want to go to see kind of the crime scene. Like if somebody, if there's a big car crash, you go the next day and you see the broken glass and you see the evidence of the crash, that's where you go. That's sort of the crime scene or there's a chalk outline of where the person was killed and you see the outline. That's the crime scene. That's where you can kind of reconstruct what happened. And in plate tectonics, it's the boundaries of the plates where you can really, I think, reconstruct things that happened. These are two books that I would recommend to you. I'm, I've got to keep moving here, but uh, this first book, Assembling California, if you, raise your hand if you've read John McPhee. Okay, if your hand's not up and you're a geology major, John McPhee is the best geology writer in the world because he writes for the New Yorker, so he writes kind of in a, a way that even if you're not a geologist, you can understand it. It's very narrative and lyrical, but he knows geology, and so he uses a lot of geological terms. And this book, Assembling California, is about ophiolites and about the, how California came to be. It's about plate tectonics, it's about ophiolites, it's about, and, it, and it's written in a way that you'll understand. I mean, I can understand it 30 years later. It's a great book. And then this book, Earth and Intimate History, is similar. It's a geologist who took a sabbatical and went to a number of places around the world and wrote about the geology in a way that's kind of more, you know how textbooks can be a little dry and dull? This is not dry and dull. These books are really interesting, and I recommend them. I, re I read them both to prepare for this talk. OK, so this is a cartoon from like a high school textbook. The Earth is made up of a series of plates, about a dozen or so of them, and they move relative to one another. They move apart from one another, they collide and they move together, or they slide past one another, right? We've all, you guys all know this, right? Um, here's another cartoon similar to one you've probably seen. At a mid-ocean ridge, you have upwelling of mantle forming new ocean crust, pushing the plates to either side, and then they eventually collide with a continent or an ocean plate over here, and one gets subducted under the other, and it gets destroyed and remixed into the mantle, and it's like a big convection cell. This is how the Earth is releasing all of its internal heat. Okay, that's plate tectonic theory, my version of it in like two sentences. But I, the problem with this is it makes it seem so smooth and neat and easy, and it almost seems like it's moving about this fast, and it's not. So that's one thing I find misleading about it. Here's another cartoon. You've probably seen this one or something just like it. Beautiful picture of this subduction zone. So you've got oceanic crust subducted beneath the continent, magma rising up, forming a volcanic arc. It's all sort of standard plate tectonic stuff. What I don't like about it is it almost seems like the, the plate, the oceanic plate is sliding down like a throat lozenge going down your throat. It's smooth, it's easy, and down it goes. Well, think about how much force you're talking about to drive this down here. And, and it's going so slow, but you've got a lot of time to work with. So, you know, that's what I think is misleading about this. And um, the rocks that I'm going to talk about, pretty much this is the setting that we think that the rocks were, um, the, the rock terrain was formed in is this collision of, of two plates and um, I'll show you that as we get later on, but it was, it, you'll see that the rocks took a beating in the process. Okay, here's another plate tectonic cartoon I like. You know, this is what amazes me is that when they first, when geologists first started talking about plate tectonic theory, they didn't have as, uh, the ability to see like the floor of the ocean as well as we can now with remote sensing techniques and other geophysical techniques. But if you could strip all the water out of the oceans and look at what's under there, I mean, here's like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And what this is showing you in colors is the age of the ocean floor. And, you know, this just fits so perfectly. You know, you've got the youngest ocean crust is right here at, where, at the ridge where it's formed. And as you go away from it, it's just pushing its way in. And the older is here and older is here. It's, it's perfect. It's amazing to me that, that it works so well. But here's the thing. Here's the oldest ocean crust in the whole world. 250 million years. That's a long time. 250 million years is a really long time, but that's like 1 20th of Earth, Earth history. So 80% of all the ocean crust that's been formed is gone completely disappeared. You know, where did it go? Well, back down into the mantle, I guess. Now, there's some evidence that if you go back more than, say, a billion years, 
plate tectonics may not have worked exactly as it does now, so maybe that's even an oversimplification, but most of the ocean crust that's been formed in Earth history is gone, except where it isn't, and that's where ophiolites come in. Ophiolites are fragments of this oceanic crust that was formed, but didn't make its way back down into the mantle. It somehow got hung up, and now you can climb around on it and look at it, and that's what, I, to me, ophiolites are the coolest thing in geology. I don't know why, kind of like Fenway Park, baseball, Ophiolites geology. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just going to. Anyone know what this is? A picture of? I got this off. I Googled it. Two varieties, black and white. I'll say black smoker. So, a black smoker. And so, this is like a subsea hydrothermal vent. So, you've got water bubbling up from the o, uh, ocean crust and up into and hitting the cold ocean water and precipitating sulfide minerals, right? You've, you guys have heard of this before. Just keep that in mind because the rocks that I studied, because they were ocean crustal rocks, have evidence that they were metamorphosed by this process, hot water kind of bubbling through them. And think about it, you've got you know, this much water on top of very hot ocean crust, you're going to have a lot of movement of water through there just circulating through and you'll see that my rocks were, were cooked this way. Okay, so this is, I got this idea, not this graphic, but this idea out of that Richard Forty book. And this one, this is the one thing you should remember about my talk, if you forget all the rest of it. Because I told you, the Earth has had a lot of time. You know, plates moving at the rate your fingernails grow, but how much time has it had to do that? Well, this is, you know, hot spot theory. There's a mantle anomaly, a hot area, and then the plate is sitting on top of it. So magma is rising up and forming a volcano on the plate, but the plate's moving, so that volcano goes extinct, and another one forms here, and then another one, you have a line of them, right? Hot spot theory. So, you know, here's the Hawaiian Islands, and so they, but if you remove all the ocean water from the Pacific, you find it's not just the Hawaiian Islands, but there's seamounts that go all the way here. You can trace that hot spot track all the way to Alaska. So the Pacific Plate, in the last 90 million years, that's 90 million years of time, has moved from where the hot spot used to be right under here, and now it's under there. Okay, that should kind of blow you away. It does me, but that's 90 million years of time. By the way, what happened right here? I, this still blows me away. Why did it bend? I, I really don't have an answer for you. It's just something to think about. Like, is the Pacific Plate moving along this way and then suddenly it shifts 60 degrees? That's a lot of force to take the Pacific Plate and shift it 60 degrees. I don't know. I, it's just something that struck me as I looked at it. But that's 90 million years. But the Earth has had enough time and if the Pacific, yeah, that's, again, that's, that blows me away too, that bend in the, in the line of volcanoes. But anyway, um, there's been enough time. If the Pacific Plate were formed when the Earth was formed, which it wasn't, it's not that old, but if it were, and it was moving at the rate it's been moving for the last 90 million years, it could have made its way all the way around the world six times. That's how much Earth history there has been, enough to push the Pacific Plate around the world six times at the rate your fingernail move, grows. Okay, that... That's, I think, my last I'm being amazed about plate tectonics slide, except I told you that it's kind of the grand unifying theory. Geologic map of North America. I don't know about you, but that's confusing to me. I'm, maybe you're smarter than me. I look at that and I just go, that's chaos, that's confusing, I don't get it. I want to be, go back to being a forestry major when I look at that. But if you, put, if you look at North America in a plate tectonic context and you kind of group the rocks, it's, it, that are similar, have a similar plate tectonic setting, it becomes a lot more understandable. You've got the Canadian Shield here. These are the oldest rocks. They've been around for, I don't know, billions of years. And they've shed all kinds of sediments down into the, the platform. So you've got tens of kilometers of sediments piled up there. And then you have these fold belts, which are the plate boundaries, Appalachians, Uachitas, the Western Cordillera. It starts to actually make a little bit of sense. Like, so now if you go out to study rocks, like I did in the Western Cordillera, well, I should be looking for what rocks that were formed at a plate boundary. And so at least you can, when you walk out there, it's not just, it can't be anything, it's these are rocks formed at a plate boundary. And it starts to actually put some sense to the whole story, at least it does to me. Ophiolites, my favorite thing in geology, um, ancient oceanic crust. And so the way this, they came to be understood to be that was a process, like a lot of things in geology, that began with observation. Some geologist in the 1800s named Steinman in the Alps noticed that he often found three rock types together. Serpentinite, dolerite, and chert. 
these three rock types. He didn't really understand why they were always together, but he saw those three rock types. And so it became known in the literature as Steinman's Trinity, because other people saw a similar association. They had no idea why. There was no real unifying theory, but they just noticed it. And around the world, people noticed, yeah, when you see serpentinite, you often see chert. And you see, so anyway, by 1972, uh, there was a, a Penrose conference where a bunch of geologists got together who'd worked in rocks like this, and they came to the conclusion, and they kind of came up with a definition of what an ophiolite is. It's ancient oceanic crust, and it has certain components. They're not always all there, but when they're all there, this is what it would look like. This would be a cross-section through oceanic crust, and I'll show you what that looks like. I will just tell you that in the years since 1972, the Penrose kind of definition has been seen to be a little bit too narrow, and that Ophiolites are rare, because I told you most ocean crust is long gone and remelted. They're rare, but they're also very diverse. You can't really put them all in one category and say they all formed at a mid-ocean ridge. They seem to form in other settings. But anyway, the reason why I love ophiolites so much is if plate boundaries are the crime scene, then ophiolites are the dead bodies, because these are the rocks that got ground up in that whole process. So why would you not go over and examine them to see what they're made of and how they got there? So here's a cross-section through a typical sort of classic ophiolite. So you have ultramafic rocks at the base, cumulate ultramafic and mafic rocks, massive gabbros, and then what's called sheeted dikes. In other words, if you've got spreading going on, you're going to open up a fracture. Magma is going to shoot up into it, erupt onto the ocean floor. So now you're going to have this vertical dike, but then that one's going to split because it's constantly moving apart. And you end up with almost looks like a deck of cards where you just have one in, uh, vertical dike after another, and then pillow lavas and other ocean floor basalts, and then uh, ocean sediments on top of it. So that's kind of the classic. If you found all the pieces, that's what they'd be. Turns out you usually don't find all the pieces. Where are they found? At plate boundaries. No shocker. So here's a map of the world showing where you can find ophiolites, and you find them where, where the boundaries of the plates are. By the way, if any of you are going to Newfoundland, one of the best preserved ophiolites in the world is in Newfoundland. I really would love to go there myself. So you can just, just imagine you're walking from the mantle up to the surface of the ocean, maybe 10 miles thick, and it's all laid out on its side for you to look at. But that's, that's the Bay of Islands right there. But my favorite thing on this map is right there. Ophiolites in the central Russia. So what that's telling you is that sometime in the distant geologic past, eastern Russia and western Russia were separated by an ocean. That ocean's gone, and what's left is some fragments of it, ophiolites in the Ural Mountains. This is a map of kind of the Alps and the area on either side of the Alps, and you just find this is where Steinman's Trinity was first recognized. So these are all ophiolitic rocks. What that's telling you is that there used to be an ocean between India, Arabia, and Africa, and Eurasia. There was an ocean there. It's called the Tethys Ocean. That's what geologists have named it, and it's gone now, but there are fragments of it where it slammed shut. They were kind of like the cat's tail being stuck in the door. Um, so geologists now have looked at enough ophiolites that they've divided them into two types depending on how they were emplaced. And one is called Tethian type because I told you the former ocean is known as the Tethys Ocean. This is what the Bay of Islands ophiolite is. It's one of these types where the ocean crust here gets in the course of subduction the, it gets abducted or pushed up over the subduction zone and it winds up lay, laying on top of the continental margin. And you, often these are the ones that are in the best shape, like you can really find all the pieces. A lot of the other, the other type I'm going to tell you about usually get ground up and they don't, they're not preserved as well as Tethian type. And this is the other type and this is the type that I studied. Um, so you have ocean crust you know, being subducted, you have a, a volcanic arc here like the Cascade Range of Oregon, and then the accretionary wedge. That's all the crap that gets scraped off the oceanic plate as it's being subducted over all the millennia. It's sediments and it's ocean crustal rocks and everything all ground up, very deformed, but often you get slabs of ophiolite in there mixed in, and, but often in a kind of a chaotic mess, right in there. And so finally, it, so often it's so chaotic that it's referred to as a melange, which is a French word meaning a mixture. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, a melange is a French word meaning mixture, and the rocks are really, th there's really no coherence to the whole thing. Oftentimes people map a melange as one unit and just say, look, we're not going to try to pick out the pieces of it and figure out it's just chaotic. But my thesis was actually to unmix a melange, to try to go in there and try to understand how did it get to be this way. So, uh, so this is the, the part of my talk that's about my thesis now. So I'm done with the background. I hope I 
stumbled through plate tectonics in a way that wasn't embarrassing for me. Um, so, so here's, my talk was about this melange, this chaotic mixture of rocks in the Greenhorn Mountains of Northeastern Oregon formed at a subduction zone. How did I choose my thesis area? I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of Eastern Oregon geology, just so the talk makes a little more sense. And then I'm going to explain to you what I set out to do, what observations I made. Again, that's the hardest part for me, is taking the time to make a lot of observations. And then what I concluded, that's my favorite part, the theory or the why. So I'll explain all that to you. So here's a map of the ge geology of Oregon. And when I got to the University of Oregon, I had never been to Oregon before, and this map was on the wall in the geology building, just like these maps of the bedrock geology of Maine. And so I used to come out of class, and I would stand here, and you know, just trying to get familiar with it. And I don't know about you, but I think one of my characteristics as a scientist is anomalies interest me. So I don't, when I look at this map, I'm not very interested in this and this and this, because it's everywhere. And that's the volcanic rocks. Wouldn't you know it? All the rocks I bragged early, oh, it's so great, they're all exposed. They didn't really interest me because they're everywhere. What interested me is all these other little bits and pieces of stuff. Like, what is that? And so sure enough, I got really interested. And this is kind of funny. Purple's my favorite color. I'm not making this up. So I just stood there and I thought, what's purple? And so I started looking at all these little blebs of purple on the map, and then I looked at the legend in the map, and it said ultramafic rocks. I really didn't have a great understanding of ultramafic rocks, but come on, I'm a boy, ultra. Ultra anything is better. <laughs> so if mafic is good, ultramafic is really good. So I, that's really, you know, that just got me thinking, what are ultramafic rocks? And so I started reading, you know, looking them up in books, and then pulling out journal articles and reading about ultramafic rocks, and it just became kind of my hobby. That's what I was interested in. And, uh, and this is where I ended up doing my thesis out there in Eastern Oregon. So again, getting back to that picture I showed you of all that volcanic rock, so exposed, easy to understand. This is the Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks of Oregon. Notice they're kind of scattered. They're hard to get to because they're covered with much younger volcanic rocks, all of which are just shown in white here. Those are all in the way. So this is what I became interested in, which is kind of classic for me. Always n never taking kind of the obvious easy way to go. I would just head in another direction, and I became interested in those rocks right there. So this, now I'm going to take you out there. So the, the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon is where the, the rocks are. The Greenhorn Mountains is a subset of this mountain range called the Blue Mountains. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like to go there, because it's really a beautiful place. And it was very remote. I was out there by myself sometimes and with my brother and a friend, and a couple of friends another time. But this is what they look like. So it's, it's you know, not as exposed as that volcanic rock I showed you, but you can see, you'll see there's some good bedrock exposure. In fact, I started in an area near here and the state geologist said, you might want to go to the Greenhorn Mountains. The same rocks that you're looking at here, they're uplifted there and so they're more exposed. And that's how I went to the Greenhorn Mountains. It's an old mining district. This is only a geologist could spend a su two summers in a gold mining district and never pay any attention really to the gold because I was interested in the ultramafic <laughs> rocks. But I did climb around in old mine tailings and old buildings, which was kind of fun. There was old junk all over the place that you could climb around on while you were doing geology. You can see there's some pretty good exposure here. This is serpentinite, by the way. It gets its name because it looks like snake skin. And um, the ro you'll see, I have a lot of pictures of serpentinite. It's really bizarre looking, actually. It doesn't really look like rock that we're used to. We see a lot of granite in Maine. It doesn't look anything like it. And it, it th that green rock there is serpentinite. And there's, again, all these old buildings that you could frame pictures in and stuff. So I have a lot of pictures like this. Again, <laughs> the mustache years. Why didn't anyone tell me how silly that looked? That's what really bothers me. Um, but anyway, you know, we, we did a lot of, we spent a lot of time climbing around on stuff. But okay, so here's the simplified version of the geology of Eastern Oregon. Um, it's thought of by geologists, a lot smarter than me, that you could kind of subdivide all those Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks into several terrains, which essentially amount to a volcanic arc, oceanic rocks. Remember I told you the accretionary wedge of ocean, ocean floor and sedimentary rocks related to that, all broken up, and then another ocean arc, a volcanic arc here. So 
Um, and by somebody, some, I can't remember the logic behind it, but there's evidence that these have been rotated this way, maybe by plate movement. So if you rotated them back, they'd be kind of north-south, like parallel to the coastline now. So you can picture kind of a, a subduction zone, volcanic arc, and then another volcanic arc moving in and slamming into the whole thing. And that's kind of my simplified version of the geology of eastern Oregon. And, and my rocks are right in there in the middle of this oceanic uh, terrain. So to give you a sense of how I, you know, how, not me, this is how geologists interpret it, getting back to this picture I showed you before of a Cordilleran type subduction zone, if you look at those arcs and the, and the uh, oceanic rocks in between, there's the volcanic arc, there's the oceanic rocks, and then the, the green volcanic arc coming in later and slamming into the whole thing. That's kind of how it's, how it's um, interpreted, and so my job was to go find, looked at rocks from right in here and try to understand how they got there and how they got so chaotically broken up. Is there anything you could do? Well, I'll tell you, if you're 23 years old and you're, the vast experience you have doing field geology is six weeks in Alaska, you probably would be wise not to pick a melange as your first mapping project because it's not layer cake geology as we've all heard, you know, described where you can sit in your truck and look across a valley, you can trace bedding all the way across, you know, the classic layer cake geology. My rocks look like this. This is, by the way, the green horn. This is what the mountains are named after, this chunk of green stone that sticks up and looks like a rhinoceros horn. But the rocks are not layer cake in any way. You can't trace anything from a distance. You can't even trace it if you're standing on it. It's more like a rice pudding. And the pudding part is serpentinite. And then the, these um, blocks in the serpentinite are other rock types related to ocean crust, basalt and gabbro and sedimentary rocks, all kind of mixed together without really much order to it. So really, 23 years old, you don't know really anything, this is where I started. And where I ended too, now that I think of it, I never did another mapping project. Please, just, just real quickly, this is a uh, uh, unabashed uh, uh, application of what we might be doing next year, one more. Not going to, there you go. Uh, one more so we get rid of that. So we're looking at Redwall, uh, Coconino, and Kaibab, I suspect up here, and that's where next year's field trip will probably go. It'll make a lot more sense than my rocks do, I'll tell you right now. Okay, so my when you when you do a master's thesis, well, the first thing you do is a thesis proposal where you explain in about 10 pages or so, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to try to accomplish. And so I, my plan was to map the melange at a large scale, get zoom right in, not try to step back and kind of say, oh, it's all, this is all a melange. I wanted to get in close enough so that I could understand how did it get so mixed up? How does this block relate to that one? And how does it relate to the matrix that they're all kind of the pudding? And um, can it be unmixed? That was my, that was my plan going out there. And, and um, I think I will say that, and look, I've read my thesis twice in the last couple months to get ready for this. I think there's some stuff in there that I still think is, is a reasonably good idea. I'm not going to say everything's right in there. You know, you don't, you don't know that much. I, I wrote what I understood and what I thought. But I do think I, I, and I'll show you some of the things that I concluded that I think hold up even over time, and, and uh, I'm proud of that. So this is kind of, now you're getting much closer to what the rocks look like in the field. I told you the serpentinite is green, and it, it tends to not hold up very well. It tends to erode easily, and so it tends, tends to form the saddles, and then these blocks form the ridges, and they stick up more because they are less, less susceptible to erosion. Here's another example of kind of the same thing. The greenstone, which is metamorphosed basalt, forms the top of the ridge, and then the serpentinite forms the saddle. Often the serpentinite, it crumbles, it falls apart, it's slippery, and it all is like a big scree slope. And then the greenstone, in this case, volcanic, uh, metavolcanic rocks, holds up better. And again, more of the same thing. This is what the locals call the green saddle, for obvious reasons, and then this block of greenstone which holds up much better. So you could do a little bit of, from a distance, you could say, well, there's a block and there's matrix, but um, what one block was relative to another is not that clear. So what I found, though, after, and others had seen this, so I wasn't shocked to find it, but I was able to find all the pieces of an ophiolite in the melange, not in any nice order, not stacked up like I showed you, but you could find 
sedimentary rocks, ocean sedimentary rocks, now meta metamorphosed, so metasediments. You could find basalt, now metamorphosed to greenstone. You could find gabbro, now metamorphosed to a metagabbro. And you could find what I really went there for, ultramafic rocks, peridotites and peroxenites, but now all metamorphosed to serpentinite. There was only one place that I found unmetamorphosed peridotite, and I'll show you that. So all those pieces, you know, if you stacked them all back up again, so I started referring to it as the greenhorn ophiolite because I wanted to study ophiolites, and now I had one, my very own. Um, it's not very coherent anymore, but all the pieces are there. Okay, I wasn't a great drafts person, the color pencil thing. This is actually a 30-year-old map that I created. I'm not that proud of it, but I thought, well, that's what it is. Um, it got me my degree, so I guess it was good enough. But this is what the melange looks like up close. This is what the rice pudding I think I have a picture of the rice pudding. So you can see you've got the serpentinite, which is in purple, is the matrix or the pudding, and then the blocks are kind of scattered throughout there, and chaotically so, except if you, know, if you step back here and you squint at it, there's a sort of a faint stratigraphy where the, this area is more the metasedimentary rocks, the middle part is more the volcanic rocks, the basalt, and then this part is more of the intrusive rocks, the metagabro, but that's very, iffy as far, because I think if you went this way or that way, you'd find they were mixed up some more. So they're not really in any order anymore, um, but there they are. That's kind of what it looks like. Here's what the metasediments look like in outcrop. They tended to have a better foliation than most of the other rocks. They tended to have a cleavage that you could spot, not always this well developed. This was probably the best developed foliation I found in any of the set, uh, metamorphic rocks. Um, this is more typical where it's kind of weaving through there. You can see a, a sort of a faint foliation in there. And then in thin section, what you found, that last outcrop, this is what it looked like in thin section. And there is a foliation which you can see kind of east to west across here or le left to right. And it's almost like you have augen of unsheared sediments and then these weaving, um, full, mostly chlorite, kind of weaving in between them. That's what the metasediments look like. And there's another sample. This one, I think this is a fossil right in here, but you couldn't really, maybe a fusel in it or something. I don't know, I'm not a paleontologist. But I did find you know, some fossils. Couldn't really recognize them anymore, but very clearly metasedimentary rocks. And then there was a lot of greenstone. And I will tell you, first of all, this doesn't look green because it weathers rusty. But when you broke it open, it was kind of green. Very unattractive rocks, I have to tell you. They're not, you know, you, you dream of rocks that you can bring home and put on your mantle and show people. The greenstones are kind of ugly, but there's a lot of it there. And this I actually interpreted as pillows. I, it's kind of hard to see here, but I think there were pillow structures. You could find other volcanic structures like this. This looks kind of like a lahar to me or a volcanic mud flow where you've got blocks in here. Again, the, the rocks themselves rust orange, but you can see when you break them open, they're more green, black, and kind of featureless. A lot of it is not a lot to see. Um, and this, uh, again, I've, I've interpreted this as a volcanic clastic rock where you've got these clasts in here and then this, this matrix that was more fine grain. And I'll show you this one. I think the next one is a thin section of that. And so this is what the clast looks like. And then this is what the matrix looks like. And it, again, they weren't even pretty in thin section, which was really a bummer because I spent a lot of time looking at thin sections and they were kind of grungy, clay, chlorite, nothing really that exciting, I'll admit. This is what the greenstones look like in crossed polarized light, the anomalous blue, Berlin blue chloride. So lots of chloride, green schist facies metamorphism, a lot of chloride, albite, epidote, but, not, and, but notice there's really not much of an alignment of minerals. A lot of times when you see green schist facies minerals, they're all lined up like a schist. You can almost peel them off, but these rocks were kind of directionless. The, the minerals were not, and that's characteristic of hydrothermal metamorphism. It's hot water bubbling through there. There's not a lot of alignment of minerals. They're kind of, they're like this. Here's the, what the gabbros look like. You could spot them in the field because they were kind of mottled black and white or kind of green and white. Um, so a little bit, but still not really that pretty, I have to admit. The, better than the green stones. They were more interesting, but not that exciting. Um, here's, here's one where you can see a little bit better the black and white, the pyroxene plagioclase sites in the rocks. And then I found layering, which excited me, because again, I was, I was really looking for, I wanted to find all the pieces of an ophiolite. So when I find, found layered gabbro, I thought, all right, now I'm in, I've got the cumulate section. I found that piece. And every time I found something that I'd read I should find, it was exciting to me. And this is what the gabbros look like in thin section. And what you found, what, what I found was that the pyroxenes, the original pyroxenes were gone, and they were all replaced by actinolite. 
and there was prograde actinolite and retrograde actinolite kind of overlapping. I'll show you a slide of that. And that's another characteristic of hydrothermal metamorphism that you get prograde and retrograde minerals in the same rock. So here's one that looks a little bit cleaner. You can see the plagioclase a little bit better there. And then here you can see two different generations of, of actinolite in here, um, replacing original pyroxene grains. So the gabbros, you could tell they were gabbros, but they didn't have a lot of the original mineralogy left. Okay, so what I, what I found though, even though these were all scattered in, and not in any order, what you found was the metasediments tended to be metamorphosed to the lowest grade, zeolite to green schist facies. The greenstones were green schist facies, the minerals, and then the metagabros were amphibolite facies. So that makes sense because if they were once stacked up and it was hydrothermal metamorphism, the water would be getting hotter as it went deeper into the crust. So that was an exciting, that was one of my first big revelations is that they're all metamorphosed hydrothermally and they had to have still been stacked up when they did or else they would be chaotically metamorphosed too, but they weren't. So that was like revelation number one, that the hydrothermal system had to be in operation while the ophiolite was still assembled. So then came the peridotite, the serpentinized peridotite. And this was, it's, it's a bizarre looking rock in the field. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides and you'll see it never looks the same twice. It's very, um, very um, modeled and different, different colors, different textures. It looks different almost in every outcrop. So here's one where it's kind of, this was pretty characteristic. You'd see kind of dark blue, light green modeling. You can see kind of snake skin look. That's how it got its name. And here's, I think I showed this slide before, but again, the green shale all kind of coming apart and sliding down slope. And when it was, when it was more um, sheared, it got blacker. So you'd sometimes see it almost black, very dark blue, looked like that. Um, again, here's much blacker. So it, it, you got to recognize it. it got, so you knew when you were in serpentinite, but it never really looked the same twice. This was probably the highlight of the whole thing for me because I told you I was interested in ultramafic rocks. I'd read about peridotites and peroxynites, upper mantle rocks, ten mi formed 10 miles down and now laying on the ground. And I found this outcrop, which is partly serpentinized. You can see crisscrossing veinlets of serpentinite here, but this is unmetamorphosed here. And when I found that, I was so excited. I, what kills me though is I don't have a sample of this. I almost want to go all the way back just to find this outcrop and take a sample, because I have a couple samples. I brought a sample of serpentinite here, but I don't have a sample of that peridotite, which really bothers me. I have rocks all over the house too. That's the funny thing, but not that one. And this is what it looked like in thin section. Now we have a pretty thin section. Finally, after all that, this is mostly olivine, so probably mostly dunite, but with some pyroxenes in it. And what you found as you looked at different rocks, you could see the progression from unmetamorphosed, which you just saw, to this one is, I mean, unserpentinized to partially serpentinized, where you can still see the pyroxene grain here, partly replaced by serpentine minerals. So it's like in the process of getting serpentinized, which is really just the addition of water. You're taking the original ultramafic minerals and adding water. And so you can see this is fully serpentinized here, but this part you have this pseudomorph, it's called a bastite pseudomorph, that's the original pyroxene grain. And here's one, you can still see some of the pyroxene here, but then there's this vein of serpentinite minerals that have completely obliterated all the original mineralogy. And then you see talc kind of in radiating sheaths, which is at least it's pretty, you know, some of the thin sections were really, I still have them and they're not pretty at all, but this one is kind of pretty. And then this is what a fully serpentinized peridotite looks like. You get this mesh texture. That was another thing is I read a lot about what serpentinite should look like. And then when you find what's described in the book, it's just kind of exciting. Like, wow, this is real. I found this myself and it's just like what they described in the book. So that's called mesh textured serpentinite. Now, here's the key to the, this is probably the, the revelation of all revelations that probably got me my master's degree. If you look at uh, the protolith, a peridotite, it has a specific gravity of about 3.3 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. I brought a sample of peridotite. This is not from Greenhorn, because I told you I failed to collect that one. This is from the Klamath Mountains in Oregon, but I'm just gonna pass it around so you can feel how dense it is. And then I'm gonna pass around after that this sample of serpentinized peridotite. So it started out just like that, and you'll see that it's so much less dense. You add all that water, it kind of opens up the mineral structure and it's much less dense. And that's kind of the key to the whole mixing of the melange. 
you're taking a rock that had a density of 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter and you're metamorphosing it or serpentinizing it to 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter, which is a lower density than the gabbro and the greenstone that is all around it. So going back to this, I told you that you could, you could imagine that these uh, upper the upper part of the ophiolite was hydrothermally metamorphosed while it was all coherent, but if that hydrothermal system had extended all the way down to the ultramafic rocks, they would have been metamorphosed to a higher grade. They would be, it would be hotter, and so you'd see minerals consistent with something greater than amphibolite facies, granulite facies, I don't know. But they, they're clearly not, because when you see the minerals in the serpentinites, they're zeolite to green schist facies. They're very low grade. So they couldn't have been metamorphosed at the same time these were, or they would have been higher grade. So something, this happened first, and then the ophiolite must have been disrupted, and later the ultramafic rocks were serpentinized. The structural geology kind of gave the whole thing away and kind of confirmed what I just told you, which is that the, the metamorphism had to happen in two phases. What I found was that the blocks themselves, all those raisins in the pudding, all had a consistent foliation that was northeast, but the serpentinite foliation was not consistent and didn't follow that same pattern. And I'll show you that on the map. And the contacts between the serpentinite and the blocks were kind of the key to the whole thing. And I still remember the day my friend and I were standing there and we were puzzling over it and we kind of said, aha, and we got our theory, which became the basis of my thesis. So this is what the northeast trending foliation looks like. It's not a beautiful cleavage like you know, you'd see in Maine and Maine rocks, uh, high, higher grade metamorphism, it, but you could definitely spot it and you could find it in the sedimentary rocks more so than the greenstones and more so in the greenstones than the gabbros. Um, this is another example and you can just see this, this foliation in the rocks and you could find it in in the rocks, um, and you could trace it from block to block. Even though they were now separated by serpentinite, you could see that they had the same foliation. So this is a map um, uh, showing you planes, uh, cleavage planes that I measured in all of these blocks in the melange. So the melange, the serpentinite is just shown in this one color. So every one of these strike dip symbols is the cleavage in those metamorphic rocks. And if you look at this, you know, you kind of squint at it, you can see that there, it is a northeast trend throughout the whole thing. So I'll just draw that on there for you. And I found that you could trace it. You know, you could be on this block and you'd see the foliation and then you'd walk over there and this block had the same foliation. Well, how could that be if there's this serpentinite in between that's kind of all wound all through there? And that was kind of the big puzzle. This is what the foliation looks like in the serpentinite. And you, it kind of, you can see these augen of unsheared ultramafic rock and then the sheared rock was kind of moving around it, almost like, um, uh, well, I call it, I refer to it as an anastomosing foliation, so kind of weaving in and out of the, uh, the clasts almost. So you could see kind of a grinding or a, a myelinitization of it and these um, unsheared blocks surrounded by sheared serpentinite. And I'll show you a couple other examples. This is another one where you can see the foliation is kind of going this way, but it kind of wraps around these unsheared blocks. And then I think I have one more that you can see a little bit better. Um, so the foliation in the serpentinite wraps around all these blocks, but it is not consistent with that northeast trending foliation. In fact, this is a map. It's not, it doesn't reproduce very well. I took this picture out of my thesis and tried to reproduce it. It's, it's hard to see. But so these are the blocks, and then all these plain, all these um, strike dip symbols are the, the cleavage in the serpentinite, and what you find is it wraps around the blocks. It's not northeast trending, all the blocks are foliated this way, but then you can see that you, can, you, you could walk around the block and you could just measure that the foliation paralleled the contact between the blocks. So, because, therefore, and, and here was another key thing that we, I remember in my second summer, we discovered where you could find blocks that were split in half and the serpentinite was in between, but you could see that these two blocks used to be together and now they were broken in half. And I'll show you two examples of that. Here's one right here. here this is a green stone, even though it's orange, and here's another piece of it, and you can see where the serpentinite is almost squeezing up in a fracture between the two pieces and spreading it apart, and the foliation in the serpentinite parallels the contact, just like that. And then another example is this one, where you have, this is that volcanic lahar, I think, and then so you've got a piece of it here and a piece of it there, and then the serpentinite, you can almost see from this one, it almost looks like it's squeezing right up in between the two. So in the end, that was, there's the foliation parallel to the contacts.
And, oh, and then the green horn itself, which I showed you earlier, that big green block of rock, underneath you could actually see a, 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 where it had been eroded, where you could actually see underneath it, and the foliation underneath it was horizontal, right here. So we interpreted that to mean the serpentinite was rising up vertically and then spreading out underneath and then coming up like that, which is key because that's how the blocks didn't get rotated. The serpentinite was rising vertically and coming around it, so the blocks, if it was coming in horizontally, it would have moved the blocks and, and spun them around. So if you read about melanges, which I have, and the theories about how you mix the rocks together, there's sort of two ways. You either do it through some horizontal process like thrusting or sliding or sedimentary processes, or vertically, the matrix coming up from below. And so we concluded the matrix must be coming up from below. And why is that? For these reasons. The included blocks aren't rotated. We found blocks split by this ascending serpentine. You could almost picture it coming up as you were standing there. And then we even found one block where the foliation was horizontal, so you could see that it was kind of bending around the block. That was the big revelation that got me my master's thesis. The pictures aren't that impressive, but I wasn't much of a draftsman. But this is how I drew my interpretation of how the blocks got mixed in with the matrix. So if you imagine you've broken up the ophiolite, you've got a piece of metavolcanic rock, you've got a piece of gabbro, and you've got a piece of peridotite like this, but the peridotite gets serpentinized, near, you know, a near surface process, and now it's less dense. So now it's below, but it's less dense than the rocks on top of it. So now it starts to rise up on fra in fractures between the rocks, and then over the many millions of years that it has to do this, eventually now the last one is going to show you the present erosion surface, and this is pretty much what the greenhorn melange looks like. You've got blocks, here's the greenhorn right here, a big piece of greenstone here, a piece of gabbro, one there, and then you've got serpentinite in the middle, and the, the foliation in all the blocks is consistent because they were all deformed at the same time. So how do we go from ophiolite to melange? This is just a review. First, the greenhorn ophiolite was formed. It was hydrothermally metamorphosed in the upper sections. Then you had some kind of collision where it got um, that northeast trending foliation. It was disrupted then. And then finally, you had serpent serpentinization and then the protrusion of the matrix kind of rising up and, and making the pudding between the blocks. So there's a cross-section I drew 30 years ago of what the greenhorn melange looks like. So you've got blocks floating around in the matrix. Okay, I'm done. And look, I have one minute to go. I'm right on time, Michael. Um, so these are the lessons that I learned. And I would tell you, if I, if, if I was in your shoes, I would talk to a lot of people, Dr. Eastler, Dr. Roish, and others who kind of been through G the geology world and get their advice, but then choose for yourself. You, ha you, know, you have to pick what interests you, because if, you, if your advisor says, I think you should do this, and then you go do it and you're not happy, you'll always say, why did I do what he said? Why didn't I do what I wanted? So listen, but then make your own choices. I would definitely recommend you go to field camp. It was, the, it was my favorite thing about you know, my four years of undergraduate, and I learned more in that six weeks than probably all the other time put together. I would choose a thesis area for a reason other than it, it's purple, but it did work for me. Um, and now I'm going to be critical of myself, and this is true of me today, so this is just who I am. And I told you, I don't really like to do detailed work. I didn't like it when I was here, I didn't like it when I was in Oregon, and I don't like it now. Fortunately, now I'm an administrator, kind of, so I hire scientists who work in the lab, and that some of them love, and you may be one like this, you love the detailed work, love measuring things precisely, and I hire people that do that, and I'm very thankful for them. They're smarter than me, and they're way more, uh, they have much more stick to -itiveness. I get to then just say, just bring me the data when you're done doing all that detailed measuring, and then I'll help, we'll interpret it together, and that's what I like to do. But I will tell you that if I, when I look back at my thesis, I wish I had spent more time in the field instead of pondering how this could have the why, I wish I'd spent more time with the what. Because I, I look at it now and I see, I wish I'd done more measurements. I wish I, I think if I had gathered more data, I probably could have had a better final product, but I, that's not my nature. And so I would just say, use your time in the field to collect data. Another thing that's characteristic of me is, you know, I had a, I started to form a theory those two summers I was out there. And then when I would find an outcrop that didn't fit my theory, I'd say, uh, let's move on to the next one. And I wouldn't, you know, because it confused me. And so I would look for something that made more sense. And I think I pieced together enough things that made sense that I do think the story holds together okay. 
but I, I'm kind of haunted by, I wish I could go back and see some of those outcrops again, because the earth doesn't create accidental rocks. If they're there, the earth formed them there, and they, they are part of the story, whether you understand it or not. So, uh, and, and finally, I would say, and I'm going to tell you that this is my last story, publish your findings. If you spend three years doing something, write a paper about it, even if it's grueling to do it. And I'll tell you exactly why that is, because I didn't do that. When I finished my thesis, I was asked, I was in my, you know, I was 25 years old, I was kind of burned out. You know, you do this for three years, it's like, I want to just be done. And I got a call from the Oregon State geologist who said, we're doing a compilation of papers on Eastern Oregon geology, do you want to write one? And I said, yeah, yeah, maybe, okay. And I didn't, you know, and I kind of hung up and I kind of sort of blew it off. I didn't really want to do it. I wanted to move on with life. And I will tell you, you know, that was almost 30 years ago. Many times since then I've thought, oh, if only I wrote a paper. I mean, I already written a 120-page paper. How hard could a 10-page paper be? It would have been a summary of that 120 pages, and I just didn't want to do it. And I would write it now. It's just that I don't think I remember all the details enough. So I thought about that. Maybe I should try to write it now and submit it. But I mean, God, come on, you do your field work in the 80s, and you write about it 30 years later. So it's kind of too late. So that's always bothered me. And when you get to be my age, you know, I'm in my 50s now, you get a lot of these moments where you say, ah, I wish I had done this differently. Well, in preparing for this talk, I told you I've spent 40 or 50 hours reading to get ready after Dr. Eastler told me he thought we could do it. And so I found this paper. I Googled, you know, uh, that's how you do research now. Born Oregon, Serpentinite, Melange. And I got this paper and I said, oh, this is great because I know him. Mark Ferns was one of the geologists who took me out there 30 years ago. So I thought, oh, he's written a paper about Greenhorn that's, you know, this is around 1998 or 2000. So I said, oh, this will show me like how the thinking has evolved and this will get me ready for my talk. So I'm reading this paper and I'm reading names in there. Of, I remember them, you know, like because I read a lot of papers back then. And I said, oh, I remember that geologist and that one. And, I, and as I was reading, I was thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if you had written a paper, they would be referencing you. They would say Hunt, and, but I didn't write the paper. And so I was sort of reading it with this sort of feeling of lament. Why didn't you do it, you idiot? You could have done it. You were offered a chance. And then I turned the page, and there I am. I'm referenced. So I didn't write a paper, but my thesis is still at the library at the University of Oregon, so they must have checked it out. And look at this. It's even my, my key idea. Um, reported deformation of melange blocks prior to serpentinite injection. So like that was the, the main idea and it's referenced. And you know, if you think about science as a big tower of, of knowledge and every, you know, scientists over the years, they contribute their one block or one block or some great scientist can contribute a whole floor to the tower and eventually, you know, the tower of, of geologic knowledge of Eastern Oregon there's one tiny little block in there, and I'll admit it's small, but it says Hunt 85. <laughs> so this has been the great gift for me to prepare for this, is I never knew this. And they actually referenced me again, and they referred to it as Hunt's Area. Now how awesome is that? Like I own the place. So that is my last... Um, <laughs> Of advice. It's never too late, number one. And there are all sorts of places that you could publish what you just did here to make it so that people, undergraduates or graduate students, who would read that paper would then publish. Journal of Geologic Education is a good example, and there are a number of others. And you could get this all in, write your paper, use the same finish you had right here with look for what happened. I didn't publish it. I've always had this problem, worried about that, but Hey, um, whatever. Then I have two blocks. Questions. Do yeah. <laughs> uh, we have questions? Anyone? Uh, okay. I answer them all. Comment. We'll invite Michael up. I just want to say this was fabulous. We should do this more often because you did a marvelous, marvelous job. Thank you very much. Worked your, a whole lot, obviously, on doing that. And I even I understood some of this stuff. <laughs> that was my goal. That was my goal. Yeah, excellent. So, so thank you very much, Paul. Again, and we'll. Uh,